In part A of this lecture, we'll talk about membranes and transport. The two major questions are what are the structures and lipid compositions of cell membranes in bacteria, archaea, and eukarya? You should recall that bacteria and archaea are prokaryotes. meaning they have no real nucleus, and eukaryotes, of course, have nuclei. One important question is how changes in membrane components affect membrane properties and function. We'll talk about that. And of course, transport is one of the most important functions of cell membranes, and we'll talk about that in more detail. Biologists look at the cell membrane as a fluid mosaic. So uh, this is called a fluid mosaic model. And a model is a conceptualization based on the data. The fluid mosaic model has two parts. The mosaic part comes from the fact that the cell membrane consists of a mosaic of lipids. So the lipids form a bilayer, and we'll talk about that in more detail in just a minute. And within the bilayer, we have a number of different components, of which the most important are proteins. And you see that some proteins go all the way through the lipid bilayer from one side to the other. And these are called integral membrane proteins. And these domains, the part of the protein that's embedded in the membrane is an integral membrane domain. And if the part of the protein goes from one side all the way across to the other, then that is a transmembrane domain. In addition to proteins embedded in the lipid bilayer, we find a number of uh, carbohydrates. These are essentially oligosaccharides. And they may be covalently linked to lipids themselves. Or proteins have also, also have oligosaccharides. And proteins containing oligosaccharides are called glycoproteins. So let's take a look at the phospholipid bilayer, or the lipid portion. You've all heard of the phospholipid bilayer, probably. And the name comes from the fact that the basic subunit is a glycerol molecule, which is a three-carbon sugar alcohol, basically. And then to each of the three carbons, we have different chemical groups attached. One of these uh, carbons contains a phosphate, and that's why they're called phospholipids, because they have a phosphate group. And then the other two carbons of glycerol have a hydrocarbon chain. So glycerol plus a phosphate plus two hydrocarbon chains. So the hydrocarbon chains can be fatty acids or other what we call aliphatic chains. Aliphatic means it's a chain of carbons and hydrogens with no oxygens, nitrogens, or any other groups. So the basic phospholipid, because of the phosphate, one portion of the molecule that we'll call the head, is charged and hydrophilic. The other portion of the molecule with these two hydrocarbon chains is extremely hydrophobic, and we call that the hydrophobic tail. And these phospholipids in aqueous solution spontaneously assemble into either micelles, when they're very small and at low concentrations. At higher concentrations, they can actually form a bilayer where the hydrophobic tails are pointing towards each other, 
the hydrophilic heads are pointing towards water and interact with water. And then there's an inner layer of hydrophilic uh, heads that are again reacting with water in the internal aqueous com compartment. And then on the size of a cell membrane, what we see is the, uh, in effect, a bilayer sheet, which goes all the way around the cell and encloses the contents of the cell. So here is a look at uh, the actual chemical structure of a phospholipid. What's shown here in the middle is the phospholipid that's found in bacteria and eukaryotes. What's shown on top are the phospholipids that are found in archaea. Now bacteria and archaea, both being prokaryotes, are very similar in size and very similar in terms of the structure or morphology. And you may wonder, you know, what's the big deal? Why do we classify them as being two separate domains of life? Well, here's one of the fundamental reasons in that their membrane lipids are completely different. So archaea do have use glycerol, shown here in red. That's glycerol. Just like in bacteria and eukaryotes. Except the form of glycerol that they use is a stereoisomer. It's a mirror image of the glycerol used by bacteria and eukaryotes. And it's very different for enzymes that use glycerol. There is also a phosphate attached to glycerol, shown here, just like in uh, bacteria and eukaryotes. Yeah. So there's some similarity here because they both have a glycerol and a phosphate, but remember the glycerol is the um, wrong stereoisomer or a different stereoisomer. But if you look here at the hydrophobic tail, what you see is something that's very different. Here in bacteria and eukaryotes, the hydrophobic tail is composed of, I don't know why that line came in, fatty acids. Okay. And fatty acids are built two carbons at a time. So the chain, this chain is built two carbons at a time from molecules called acetate, which contains two carbons. And so our fatty acid tails are just long, straight hydrocarbon chains. But in archaea, their hydrocarbon chains are built from what are called isoprenoids, or isoprene subunits, which is a five carbon chain, or a five carbon molecule. So there is an isoprene chain with one, two, three, four, five carbons. It's branched. And these are strung together. So the biochemistry of these fatty acid tails is completely different from the biochemistry of uh, the fatty acid, uh, of the isoprene um, chains in archaea is completely different from the fatty acid chains um, in bacteria and eukaryotes. Not only that, but these uh, chains are hooked to or covalently linked to glycerol in what's called an ether linkage. So when you have a carbon connected to a, another carbon through an oxygen bridge, and the carbons are not fatty acids, or don't contain this carbonyl group, that's called an ether linkage. So why do archaea have these strange, to us anyway, uh, kinds of lipids in their membranes? Well, what we see is that in archaea, at least some of their phospholipids actually are, form a, a complete covalent linkage from one side of the lipid bilayer all the way to the other. So instead of, in our membranes and bacterial membranes, having a lipid bilayer consisting of two leaflets, so a leaflet is one sheet 
of a lipid bilayer. So we have one leaflet and a second leaflet, and the two leaflets interact because their hydrophobic tails interact with each other. In archaea, it's basically essentially a monolayer with hydrophilic groups on both sides. And you can imagine that this type of structure in archaea is going to be much stronger and more resistant to environmental stress than the uh, bilayer leaflet structure. And archaea tend to inhabit extreme environments, and therefore this type of a lipid in their membranes may, well, is undoubtedly of adaptive significance. Now when we look at variations in lipid composition, what we find is that eukaryotic cells have membrane lipids that are unique to just eukaryotes and not found in bacteria or archaea. And these are cholesterol, or more generally sterols, not all eukaryotes have exactly cholesterol, they use other variants, but they all fall into the family of sterols, which all contain four rings. In addition, eukaryotic cells contain a non-phospholipid lipid in their membranes called a sphingolipid, shown here. As you can see, it has no glycerol backbone. It does have a single fatty acid chain. What's shown in brown is the molecule called sphingosine. Now together, cholesterol and sphingolipids can constitute up to 50% of the lipids on the outer leaflet of the plasma membrane of eukaryotic cells. So what's strange is that cholesterol can be found in both sides of the uh, plasma membrane, in both leaflets. Sphingolipids are found only in the outer leaflet. And basically only in the plasma membrane. And vesicles called endosomes that are derived from the plasma membrane or will fuse with the plasma membrane. So these molecules are not found in the endoplasmic reticulum. Um, or in mitochondria. Uh, and neither is cholesterol. Cholesterol is usually found mostly in the plasma membrane as well. Oh, and the functions of both cholesterol and sphingolipids is that, are that um, they both um, uh, strengthen membranes. cells do not live, or eukaryotic cells cannot live without cholesterol or uh, sphingolipids. Uh, mutants that can't make these uh, die, uh, and their membranes uh, become extremely leaky. And so their uh, role appears to be in uh, making membranes stronger, uh, less permeable, yeah. and cells can adjust the amount of cholesterol in their membrane to adjust the permeability of their membranes. Okay. One other thing I want to mention is that cholesterol, it, the biosynthetic pathway is really complicated, but synthesis of cholesterol requires atmospheric or molecular oxygen. In fact, it requires 11 molecules of oxygen to synthesize one molecule of cholesterol. Which means that eukaryotes could not have arisen until there was sufficient oxygen, free oxygen, available for cholesterol synthesis. Now, bacteria also have lipids that are special to them. And these are called hopanes. 
Copanes are, you can think of them as the bacterial equivalent of sterols. Now, unlike sterols, they have, which have four rings, hopanes have five rings, and no oxygen is required for the synthesis of hopanes. Hopanes are thought to serve a similar function in strengthening the membrane um, and controlling membrane permeability as sterols in eukaryotic cells. One of the interesting things about hopanes is that they're abundant enough um, in geology in petrochemical deposits that uh, some people think that they are the most abundant lipids or in fact the, the most abundant uh, biological molecules on earth because of their presence in petroleum deposits. Now returning to bacteria and eukaryotes, our membranes, the, the phospholipids and the fatty acids are not all the same. In fact, they vary in the kind of fatty acids they have. The fatty acids linked to glycerol in our phospholipids can vary in the chain length. So palmitic acid has 16 carbons, stearic acid has 18 carbons, and arachidic acid has 20 carbons. So they can vary in the chain length. And then they can also vary in the number of double bonds. When a double bond is introduced between two carbons in this chain, then that causes a, a, a bend or kink in the uh, carbon chain. And I will show you exactly how that works in the next slide. And a fatty acid chain that has one double bond is called a monounsaturated fatty acid. So saturated fatty acids have the maximum number of hydrogens. With no double bonds in the carbon chain, each chain in the carbon has two hydrogens, the last carbon has three hydrogens, there's the maximum number of hydrogens. When you put in a double bond, each double bond means that uh, the chain has two fewer hydrogens and we can have unsaturated fatty acids. And then there are polyunsaturated fatty acids, meaning they have more than one double bond. And with, e with each additional double bond, you get uh, increased bending. Linoleic acid has two double bonds. Linolenic acid has three double bonds, and you can see it actually begins to look like a hook. And arachidonic acid has four double bonds. It's almost beginning to close in upon itself. Now you can imagine that a membrane with phospholipids consisting only of these straight saturated hydrocarbon chains these will pack together really well and form a very rigid, impermeable membrane. When you start mixing in these monounsaturated and polyunsaturated fatty acids, now these fatty acid chains cannot pack as well. There's, these disrupt the packing and they increase the permeability. and fluidity of the lipid bilayer and the cell membrane that they're present in. So this is important because membranes must maintain a certain amount of fluid, fluidity for all the things that they have to do um, and for to allow uh, transport of materials across the membrane. You can't have too much, otherwise the cell gets way too leaky. 
and you can't, but you still have to have some to allow uh, diffusion and transport processes. So here's what I, uh, so here is why uh, double bonds cause a bend in the fatty acid chain. This is a naturally occurring double bonds. So in naturally occurring fatty acids, all double bonds are in what's called the cis configuration. Meaning that the sole hydrogens that are left to these two carbons are on the same side of the double bond. The alternative is that the two hydrogens could be on opposite sides of the double bond, and that's called a trans configuration. Here is transoleic acid. Well, all naturally occurring fatty acid, monounsaturated, polyunsaturated, they all put their double bonds in cis configuration, causing a bend. If you have the double bond in trans configuration, well then there is no bending. It, it's uh, very much, it's very similar to an unsaturated, or uh, it's very similar to a saturated fatty acid with no double bond. These trans fatty acids occur only in man-made fatty acids or in processed lipids. So when you buy a product at the grocery store and look at the label and if it says it has hydrogenated vegetable oil that is how you get trans fatty acids. Trans fatty acids, um, the cell, your cells never see trans fatty acids naturally, and they really don't know how to deal with trans fatty acids. And trans fatty acids uh, just are not good for you.